How many believe everything will be all right? Now, it, it, it is difficult to believe everything's going to be all right when it seems like everything's all wrong. But that's where you need faith because your evidence for it being all right cannot be in what you see or in people or the reports you're getting from the doctor. You're going to have to get your faith from Scripture, from God's promises. You know, th there's a Scripture that says, and we know it in Psalms 23, Though I walk through the valleys of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and staff comfort me. It's not saying that we will not go through dark moments, that we'll not go through some valleys of shadows of death. But, that, but by faith we're saying, I know this, I'm going to get through this valley, I'm going to get through this trial, I'm going to get through this difficulty, I'm going to get to the other side. And on the other side, God is going to prepare a table before my enemies. Everybody that thought that I wasn't going to make it, that was hoping I wouldn't make it. There's some people in, come on, there's some people in our lives that are naysayers and they're just waiting for you to fall and mess up. I got good news. God's not like that. He's saying, I know you, I, I, I see what you're going through, but I'm going to get you through it. You're going to get to the other side. If you believe everything's going to be all right, just give the Lord a little hand by faith for your own self. We're now going through a portion of scripture as we're going through our daily growth book. And for you that don't have the daily growth book yet, you can still get one, I'm sure, in the foyer. And next, we're getting ready for next year's daily growth book. We're working on it right now. But we've been going through 10 books of the Bible, verse by verse, studying them every single day. And the portion of scripture that we're going to be covering today was this week's DG or discipleship group message. And it was in First Corinth. It's in First Corinthians 11, um, verse 20 through 26. Say with me, First Corinthians um, 11, 20 through 26. So we're going to read through these portions of Scripture and verse by verse. But as we go through it, this is a question that we're going to be asking ourselves: Are we on track? Or I would say this: Are you on track? There's such thing as being off track and, and there's such thing as being on track. If you're, if you're on track, that means you're doing what you should be doing. And if you're doing what you should be doing, it will result in success, in achievement. When you're off track, you're no longer doing what you should be doing, which will result in lack of progress and eventual failure. The worst thing that can happen is that you think you're on track, but you're actually off track spiritually. So this portion of scripture, just to give you a background, Paul wrote it, and he was Apostle Paul. He became, uh, whoa, they, they got music going on here? There we go. I, it, Apostle Paul wrote this, and, and when he, he, he wrote it to the church of Corinth, and, and there would be times that he would actually be encouraging, but this one was a correction letter. A lot of people don't like to be corrected, but I've learned this. At times, the, 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 you grow most in times of correction. Of course, there's times to praise, but there's also times to correct. And the Corinthian church got off target. And this is what he begins to talk to them about. He's going to try to get them back on track. And in 1 Corinthians 11, 20, it says, when you meet together... You are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. Uh, these are some of the signs that yeah, you could be off track. Sign number one, it's no longer about the Lord at all. Do you know that you could continue coming to church and just lose your focus? It's no longer about the Lord. There are some in this room that you're here for, we're all here for, a lot of people are here for different motives. Some people are here for the right motive, and some people aren't quite there yet. They might be here to pick up on a girl for all we know, right? The only reason I'm here is because this pretty girl right by my side, if she wasn't inviting me, I would not be here. I guarantee you that, right? Now, you, you could be here, uh, wrong motive. You could actually be in church to show off your gift. 
Do you know there's some people that they feel that they're so gifted that when they're using their gift, it's not to glorify God, it's to get praises from people like, clap for me. Did you see how great, I tore the house down. Did you see that note I hit? Oh, I don't even, I, I, I don't think Whitney Houston could have hit that note. <laughs> right? You could come to show off. There's some, and there's nothing wrong with dressing nice coming to church, but there is a problem that you dress so nice, the only reason you're dressing nice is to show off your new threads. Right? Uh, man, did, did they see me? Did they see my new purse? $3,000. Right? We could come for all kinds of wrong reasons to church. We could, we could come just to check it off the list. It's just a religious thing I'm doing. Every week I just check it off the list. Do you really know God? I don't care about that. I'm just checking it off the list. It's the wrong reason. Now these people, what he's saying, you're not coming for the Lord no more. You're not coming to worship the Lord. We could even make the worship said about us. I don't know why they didn't sing my favorite song. <laughs> now, of course, we have favorite songs. But let's not forget, this is not about worshiping you and give you some easy listening. This is about worshiping the creator of the universe, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. It's about the Lord. We could actually be in the room and make it about us and be offended. You know, if you come to church and you get offended, you just made it all about you. Well, I went to church, I got offended. You just made it all about you. There, see, when, because it's about the Lord, you can't afford to get offended because it's going to mess up your worship. It's going to mess up your. It's going to mess up your connection with God. Don't let people offend you out of your purpose. Our purpose to come together. Number one purpose to come together is to lift up the name of Jesus and thank Him for what He's done. We don't come to church to be entertained. We don't come to church to get a paycheck. That's for people that, that actually come to church and they're on staff. We don't come to church to get a paycheck. We come to church to worship God. Well, if you don't pay me, I ain't showing up. See, do you, do you understand that we could come with the wrong motives? And that's all he was saying. He goes, you, you, you guys meet together. And you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper. I could even just say that. You're not, you come together and you're not even interested in the Lord. Could it be that you could be in church and be totally distracted by your phone? Oh, I wonder if they, uh, if they give me a like. I only got five likes. What's wrong with me? You're making it about something else, and, and it could easily happen to Christians that have been in church for a really long time. You could lose your praise. You could lose your passion. You could lose your fire. You don't even want to sing. But you'll sing, you'll, you'll sing with 99.1 every song. You got your rock and roll songs. You got your oldies, and you sing those like it's worship. But when it's time to worship the Lord in the house of God, you can't open your mouth. And the reason is, it's no longer about the Lord. You would go to a concert and you would jump, you would raise your hands high, you would throw up the devil's side, you do all of it. But when it comes to the house of God, where's the praise? Now, I'm not dogging you if you can't praise right now. What I'm letting you know, if you can't praise, you're off track. Now, if diagnosing that we're off track, it's never to hurt us, it's to get us back on track so we can get, come on, accomplished, so we can see the success and the vision that God has for your life. You're not here to get offended by people. You're not here to fight with people. You're not here to cause drama. You are here, and I am here to lift up the name of Jesus, the one and only Savior. Let's remember. 
So number one is that we, we lot, we're no longer, no longer about the Lord. It's about something else. And it's no longer about the Lord, and I'll tell you why. Because we've lost our gratitude for what Jesus has done for us. Now, it is about the Lord, if you remember, where Jesus found you before you gave your life to him. And, and if you're here for the first time, this could be the biggest day of your life. Because I'm going to introduce you to the one and only Savior of the world. The only one that can set you free from your addiction. The only one that can make you a brand new person. The only one that can restore you after you've messed up your life and you're thinking about giving up. And God is saying, you come to me, I'll restore you, I'll make you brand new, I'll give you a brand new life, I'll give you a purpose. I will blow people's mind what I'm ready to do for you. And then I'll give you eternal life forever and ever in a heaven. <laughs> Let's not forget what Jesus did. For. Let's humble ourselves. Do you know if you're judging the people and you've become a church critic or a Christian critic or a food critic, no, food critic, you could be a food critic. <laughs> but, but there's some Christians that think they have an, like a gift of criticism like and they 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 put it under discernment i got the gift of discernment critic critic crit, crit, discernment god did not give you a gift to tear brothers and sisters apart god did not give you a, a gift to to expose people's weaknesses and talk about them. Now you build people, you encourage people, and if God shows you something, it's never to tear somebody else down, it's to help them. A doctor doesn't go in there and accuse you, he goes in there to heal you. Now God will show you stuff, but it's always to build. It's not about us. Let's humble ourselves. Let's get back on track. Without the Lord, I'm a nobody. Without the Lord, I'm a bound sinner. Let's not mistake even the giftings that you have. Stop being proud of them and start being thankful for them. Stop being prideful about them. Start being thankful because it was the Lord that gifted you. He's the one that gave you the talent. He's the one that gave you the brain. He's the one, come on, he's the one that helped you be who you are. How are you going to take credit and you didn't create yourself? Well, I got drive. Well, God even gave you drive. I'm a go-getter. Well, go get him. But don't take pride in your go-getting. Thank God that God put a, come on, he put a spunk in your step. He gave you drive. He gave you a purpose. He gave you a mission. He gave you a dream. There's people depressed. There's people hopeless. There's people blind. They can't see it. Give God some praise that he's giving you some gifts, but don't get proud about it. It's no longer about the Lord. In Psalms 107, it really says it clear. It says, it says, oh, thank God, he's so good. Let's get back to that. We, we really need to get back to that. Oh, thank God, he's so good. His love never runs out. Someone should make a song about that. His love never runs out. All of you set free by God. I love this. Let's bring the thanksgiving back and we'll get back on track. First, we have to remember that it was Jesus that set you free. And if you're in this room, only Jesus can set you free. You cannot set you free self free from your addiction you cannot set your free yourself free from the depression you cannot set your free yourself free from the craziness you cannot set yourself free from the sickness but i got some good news 
that if you're bound and you're tormented and you're addicted and you're hopeless, there's a Savior that can set every single person free, and his name is Jesus. Thank God that he sets you free. All of you set free by G-O-D, you know me. And he says, tell the world. Tell how he freed you from oppression, depression, torment, nightmares, suicidal spirits, hopelessness, selfishness, pride. Tell them who set you free. Come on, tell somebody. Come on, let's give a little praise to our one and only Savior who the Son sets free. It's free indeed. You can have a brand new start today. Leave your chains here. We have to go back constantly and remember that. It's about the Lord. Let's not make it about us. Well, you know what? It's just hard to get parking. I know it's hard to get parking, but though it's, it's about you coming in here and giving God some praise. And I tell you, it's hard to get parking at the movies. It's hard to get parking at the mall. It's hard to get parking. Come on. It's hard to get parking sometimes at your job. But you still go. It's hard. Come on. On the freeway, it's hard to drive. <laughs> but all of a sudden in church, it's just too hard. Where's your worship? Come on, killer. Come on, killer. Come on. Are there anybody here that's a true witness of Jesus Christ? I'm not playing. I'm sold out. I know where I was before Jesus came into my life. I was a mess until he set me free. Come on, does anybody pray? Come on, that's a little praise when you remember. Come on, you remember where you were. You remember. Come on, you remember the chains. You remember the oppression. You remember everybody gave up on you. Nobody believed in you. But sign number two is no longer about the Lord. It's about us. Sign number two, we're no longer generous. When our generosity dies, we even become blinded to the needs of others. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty one, 21, it says, For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. Now, I want you to understand this. It's describing a church service. And in those church services, some of you guys know about old-time church services. I used to go to old-time Pentecostal church. And after church, we always had a potluck. Everybody would bring their best dishes. Everybody on the church was overweight. That's just the way it was. We did not care. It was just good. It didn't matter if it was healthy. Come on, bring me that banana cream pie. Just bring it over here. Bring me the chili. Come on, bring me, bring me, bring, bring me. <laughs> so many people would just come to get the potluck. But, but so in this in these days it was kind of like that, but it was set up this way that the rich obviously used to bring the choice food and they used to bring a lot of food into this church service, and they would also have the Lord's Supper with it. So they'd have meals and they'd have meals, everybody bringing their meals on wheels, and then they would also they would also do communion. But this is what happened, the rich people would bring all kinds of food, and it, it turned into showing off how wealthy they were. So they would let out, they would put out their spread like, ah, steak, lobster, king crab, tortillas. <laughs> but they would have this long spread. And they would eat in front of the poor because the poor couldn't bring nothing because they didn't have nothing. So this is what would happen. The poor would now watch the rich eat in church and the rich wouldn't share their, their wealth or their food with others. What kind of church is this? Well, 
the kind of church it is, is a church that's off track. They're, they're thinking it's all about them. They're thinking it's all about their wealth. They're thinking, let me show you how blessed I am. And if you're not blessed, too bad, too sad. You're probably not blessed because you don't work as hard as I do. See, when you don't want to be generous, you just come up with stuff. You just say stuff. Like, you, you start saying, like, they should get their own food. What's mine is mine. What's yours is yours. Right? We start, we start talking ourselves out of giving, and our hearts almost become hard towards them. So they began not without sharing. As a result, some went hungry. Just imagine all this abundance of food, and there's brothers and sisters in the church hungry. And that's why giving is so important, because what we do is spread the wealth. We can have a men's home that's, that's rescuing people off the streets right now, that they don't have to worry about food, they don't have to worry about clothing, they don't have to worry about electricity. All they need to worry about is serving God, getting set free, and starting a new life in Christ. Because of the giving, we have orphanages in Kenya and Uganda that's rescue little boys and little girls that are on the streets with no mama, no dad, no welfare system. But we go down there in the streets and we bring them off the streets and we let them know there's a church that loves you, that's generous, and we're able to take you in, feed you, put you in school because there's a group of people that are on track because of our generosity. We could have a, a food warehouse with thousands and millions of pounds of food that go through that warehouse every single year that are, that's able to feed people that are hungry, senior citizens that are struggling. Do you know that, that, that the, the senior citizens in our city, 65 and older, are the poorest group demographically in the whole city? A lot of them are in the poverty line. And they don't, they can't do anything. They can't go out there. They have no family. What that means, if they're hungry, they just go hungry. But thank God that we have a ministry, a, a, come on, a senior ministry that goes out there and has a banquet and takes care of the seniors and visit them in the convalescence home and let them know, I know you don't have no family right now, but we'll go ahead and be your family because there's a group of people that are generous. What we're saying is, let's get back on track. This is what I've learned. Lack of generosity is proof that our love for God and others is off track. If, if, we, if we could get to the point that we could overlook people's needs and it doesn't bother you, hurt you, convict you, or doesn't bring any compassion... It's all it means. We're off track. And it's easy to get off track. Working, buying things, consuming, materialism, bills, life. But it can happen to any one of us. And in 1 John 3, 17, it says, suppose someone has enough to live on. Right? Suppose someone has enough to live. And sees a brother and sister in need, but does not help. Let's say we have this dinner with all kinds of extra food. And people are hungry, looking at your table and looking at your barbecue ribs. And you said, what you looking at? Keep your eyes on your own table. We don't have nothing. That's not our problem. So when we don't give, that's exactly what we're saying. That's not our problem. It's getting quiet right now. It says, you see the brother says, but does that help? Then God's love is not living in that person. My children... We should love people not only with words and talk, but are by our actions and true caring. Let's give God some praise that we're not just, come on, we're not just talkers, we're doers. And we prove that we love them by being generous. 
But when we're off track, it can even get worse. We can actually become prejudiced towards the poor. You, you'll even quote scriptures that don't even exist. God helps those who help themselves. You know that scripture, buddy? Where is this, sir? I don't, I've never read the Bible. Don't worry about it. It's there. And that's why I'm not giving you nothing so you know. That scripture tells me you got to help yourself. <laughs> right? You might even say something like this. All the church wants is my money. You're off track. Look at all the lives that are being transformed. This week, something tragic happened right here on the university. There was a car accident. Three young ladies were killed in that car accident. Two were thrown out of their cars. And one of the girls that was thrown out of their car started coming to the way two months ago. We're going to do the funeral here. The families, in it, the three girls, they're going to have the funeral for the three girls here. They just, she just 18 years old, just got saved two months ago and was volunteering in our children's ministry already. And, and she didn't know she only had two months to live. But we know this, that that young lady, is gonna, we're going to meet her on the other side of glory in heaven. Because there's a church that's open. Because there's a generous group of people that keep the lights on. Keep, come on, keep, keep it going. And that's what we have paid for the seats so she could have come here and be saved. It, isn't that great? But be careful that you don't, we don't become prejudiced against the poor. James 2.1 says, my dear brothers and sisters... How can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Now, we got to be careful with that, that we favor some people over others. For example, he says in James 2, 2, he says, for example, suppose someone comes in your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed with dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you stand over there or I'll sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? He's talking about motives. And when, our, when we're off track, our motives are off. We start categorizing people based on what we think they could do for us. It's not saying that we shouldn't treat a rich person well. What he's saying, you should treat everybody well. Come on, amen, come on. We should treat everybody well. And you never know who's going to be the key that's going to lock your future. It might be the person that you're looking down on and God is just looking. I'm bringing this person in, but they're going to unlock your future. I remember, and I'll, I'll share this story, and I shared it with membership class. But I remember Franklin. And Franklin was one of the homeless people I met on the streets of San Bernardino before we started the church. And right now on 2nd Street, there's tent, there's, it's the same thing as when we first started ministry, the, the, that, that Second Street Park is full of homeless uh, people living there. And, and it was the same when we started the church. And I remember I was with my girls. I stopped the car and I, and I, and I said, girls, we're going to go talk to the people in the park. And I took my little girls outside the car. And you might be saying, why are you taking little girls? I show my little girls real ministry. And I believe as we're doing ministry, there's a protection on my life doing ministry. I, 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 no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm out there to love some people. And when we're walking in love, there's no fear. God's perfect love casts all fear. I'm there to help somebody. So we, we got out of the car. I, I just couldn't just drive by. So I stopped and I, and I. And I said, uh, I walked up to and this, this home, homeless man came up. There was a whole bunch of homeless under the, the awning. And he came up and he represented all the homeless in the park. He was their representative. He was their spokesman. He was their ambassador. And he came up to me. He goes, and this is what he said. What do you want? I go, well, we're thinking about starting a church in this area. But there's no need to start a church. And we don't even know what your needs are. What are your needs? 
And he quickly just said, we're hungry. There's no feeding program on Saturday. All of us are hungry. I go, I'll be right back. I had enough money to buy food for everybody in that part. So why wouldn't I? If people are hungry, I would like to have a little burrito. So you know what we did? We went, we went to we went to Bakers. Our kids, my little girls were so excited. Bakers, bakers, dun, 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 bakers. It's not for you. <laughs> we're an army. <laughs> Stand up, girls. Say yes, sir. Not kidding. I just say this. It wasn't like that. <laughs> but it wasn't for them. It was for the family. It was for them. So we bought a whole bunch of burritos, fries, and cokes, and a whole bunch of them filled. I was in the suburban. We filled that whole back area with a whole bunch of meals. And, and, and then I had my little girls distribute it throughout the whole park. And everyone got a burrito, and they got a fry, and they got a Coke. What was that, a mama meal or a papa meal? I used to work for a baker's. What was it? Tell us all. But all I know is that by the time we were done, they were all full. A lot of them were very grateful. But there was a day that we started the church, and every single one of those homeless people, they didn't come just because we invited them. They came because we showed them some real love. It wasn't just talk. We didn't pray. I hope the Lord brings you some food. Could it be you're praying for something you should be doing? got money they don't have shoes well, uh, well shoes come and cost 50 bucks so that's why God gave you the 50 bucks they don't have shoes you don't do this let's pray that God would supernaturally release from his abundance according to scripture God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory he oh hallelujah oh hallelujah oh, you feel that ah And they're like, I don't feel nothing. Where are my shoes at? <laughs> you don't need to pray for shoes. You, he just tied my shoes. I, I didn't tell him to do that. It's not, it's not like I'm like got slaves around. It's just a, like tie my shoes, homie. <laughs> you see my shoes are not tied. You better get to it. That's no, good. I just. <laughs> I feel weird about that. That's why I just said that. I feel weird. Another man tying my shoes. I feel a little weird. I feel like I was violated. Actually, I just, I just kidding. I just kidding. Okay. All right. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You guys are going too crazy now. Let's get back to business. You guys need to get back on track. Uh, well, God is good. Buy him the shoes. Come on. Bless him. Don't pray for them. Bless them. If God shows you a need and you can meet it, you're supposed to meet it. If God shows us needs in this church, we're not supposed to ignore them. We're supposed to give to them. We're, we're called to do God's business. Jesus is still feeding the hungry. Jesus is still clothing the naked. Jesus is still setting people free. But he does it through you and me. Before we backslide, you know what backslides first? Our tithes and offerings. We already know you're exiting the church because your heart's somewhere else when your tithes and offerings leave before you. <laughs> Two things happen when you're ready to backslide. You stop giving and you stop serving. You start putting resignation letters like, I'm just letting you know, I'm putting my two weeks notice for this nursery department. Because the Lord has told me I need to take a Sabbath rest. You have been working for two, two months. I know, but it's the Lord. <laughs> all righty, all right. All right. In Matthew 11, 7, it says, no, Malachi 11, 7. It says, yet from the days of your fathers, you have turned away from my statutes. I, I've given you laws, but you've turned away from them. I've given you commandments, and you turn away from them, and ordinances, and have not kept them. And he says, I, you've been off track. I want you to come back. Return to me. 
and I will return to you. My favor will return to you. My peace will return to you. My freedom will return to you. Come on, come on. My, my blessing will return to you. Could it be that you're depressed and you might be in the church, but you have not returned yet? You haven't returned yet. You have not repented of your sins yet. You haven't been willing to give your all yet. He says, return to me. I love that he comes to us and he says, return because he wants, he's the one that's trying to reconcile the relationship. Says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how should we return? What he's saying is, we didn't even know we were off track. We didn't even know that we left. He goes, and he goes, God says, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, in what have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings that you have withheld. And when you withheld your tithes and offerings, you were withholding your heart. As soon as you said, I'm no longer going to be generous, I'm no longer going to give, I'm no longer going to worship with my money, this is what happened. You left. That's like Lisa, me and Lisa being married, and I said, baby, I want... I mean, I give you everything but my money. <laughs> That'd be kind of cold blood. I mean, it's a good idea. But I'm saying, that's kinda, <laughs> we'd be rich right now if I could do that. Just, <laughs> just kidding. It's okay. She could take a joke. <laughs> but imagine me working, making money, and she says, honey, can we have food for the groceries? I go, baby, this relationship, you got all of me, but not my money. This is good. That's straight. Could it be that that's how we're serving the Lord? You got all of me, but you don't have my money. You don't have my generosity. You can't use me to bless anybody. And what you're literally saying, you don't have my full heart. Let's get off that subject. Someone just got offended. They got offended because they're off target. Not just kidding. <laughs> I, I'm not going to get through all these signs, but sign number three. Sign number three is you are going back to your old habit. In 1 Corinthians 11:22, while others get drunk. Now, this is one of those old habits. Now, this is what happened. God delivered them from the alcohol. God delivered them from the alcoholism. God delivered them from the crack. God de delivered them from the weed. God delivered them from the lust. God delivered them from the pornography. God de delivered them from the demons. God, de God, de God delivered them from the depression. God delivered them from the anxiety. God delivered them from the anger. That were always, and God delivered them from the pride. God delivered from the violence. God delivered them. He set them free. But how do you know you're getting off track? You're dabbling in what God set you free from. Now, these Corinthians, this is what was going on. Before they came to Jesus, they were a party city, and they used to have crazy, wild orgies, parties, getting drunk, getting high, whatever, all weekend long to worship their pagan god. So what they did was, it was no longer about the Lord. It was no longer about generosity. It was no longer about others. It was about themselves. And when they made it all about themselves, they went back to their old selves. And what they did was, this is what they did, they brought their old parties into church. So they weren't just, imagine the kind of church that was. Like these meals, the poor, that's your business. And then the people that had money also had Jack Daniels, they had champagne, and they weren't just drinking a little bit, they were getting drunk. So these type of church services, Paul had to say, it would be better that you guys don't come together because what you're doing now is a disgrace to God. You're no longer celebrating Jesus. It's no longer about worship. Actually, you're giving God a bad name. It's true that if you're a Christian and you're practicing the lifestyle of a non-believer, understand you're off track and you're being a disgrace to Jesus. Oh, 
man, I don't want to hear that. Now, the reason we say that because we want you to get on tracks so you can start getting blessed again. So you can start having peace again. So you can start living free again. So you can start being a blessing to your family again. Right? In 1 Corinthians, now, 5.11 says this. I meant that you are not, check this out, crazy. You're not to associate with anyone. Who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy, worships idols, or is abusive, or is a drunkard, or cheats people. Don't even eat with such a person like that. Crazy. What do you mean? There's two reasons that God says don't associate with a believer that's acting like a non-believer. He didn't say don't associate with a non-believer. He said don't associate with a believer that's claiming to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. And he still practices sexual morality. He's still getting drunk. He's still being abusive, acting like he was before he came to Christ. Don't associate with them for two reasons. One is you'll be endorsing their lifestyle. You got to let them know. You're not in fellowship with the Lord, so you can't be in fellowship with us right now. You got to repent of that to get restored. Now, we're not some, talking about somebody that's dabbling. We're talking about something that is practicing and being re- unrepentive about it. Well, you know, I, I just really believe that Jesus drank wine. I'm just drinking like Jesus. He turned the water into, how come you only know the scriptures about wine? He turned the waters into wine. Why you only know wine scriptures? Because maybe you're a wine no. Don't get offended, I'm smiling. I would say, don't get mad, just get right. Let's get back on track. We got to stop. Come on. We got to understand there's a standard to this living. And if we're worshiping God, we got to get back on track. The standard is not this world. We're not trying to be like them. We're trying to be like Jesus. And we're letting people know, follow me as I follow Christ. I'm not perfect, but I ain't the man I used to be. I'm not practicing the sins I used to be. If I fall, I get right back up because that's not me anymore. But don't be the believer that's justifying your alcoholism. Because God is saying, no one should eat with you. Don't be the believer that's practicing sexual immorality, committing adultery, sleeping with everybody. I mean, going on Christian dating sites and then sleeping with people. What kind of Christian dating site is that? Harmony.com. Well, God wants us to be united. So I unite every night with a sprint from person. <laughs> All right, we're done because you guys can't handle it no more. Let's get it. <laughs> Finally, you know, I love you guys. And it's just time to get back on track. Because when you get back on track, you get, this is, this is what's so beautiful about it. It says right here in the scripture, it says in Isaiah 20, 29, 24, Those who got off track will get back on track. And complainers and whiners will learn gratitude. I love it. Those who have been off track, they're going to get back on track. And the complain, why, why complainers and whiners? Because when you stop being grateful, you stop being a praiser. And when you stop being thankful and you stop being a praiser, you become a complainer. And you become a whiner. God's going to restore someone's praise tonight, someone's joy tonight, someone's, come on, someone's walk tonight, someone's integrity tonight, someone's blessing tonight. Come on, does anybody want to get back on track, back progress and moving ahead, winning, seeing victory? Let's give God just one more praise. Let's all stand up all over the room. Online, we love you. I'm going to dismiss in just a second. If you leave right now, you're off track. I'm just kidding. Relax. Relax. Calm down. You guys are too wild.
This is the first time I preached on Wednesday night, like, like um, and I don't know how long. I'm a little jittery, right? I'm <laughs> just having, to, having a little too much fun. But I want to let you guys know we love you. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Life is all about Jesus. Now, I, I'm not talking about a religion. It's all about Jesus. Jesus said this, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father. No one goes to heaven. Unless they go through me. A religion can't save you. Your own good works can't save you. You can never be good enough to save yourself. As a matter of fact, you can't set you free, yourself free from the addictions, the struggles, the torment, the sleepless nights, the cycles of destruction that you've been in. You can't fix you. A psychiatrist can't fix you. They can help you cope, but they can't fix you. But there's a Lord that can set you free, make you whole. He promises to give you an abundant life. And I'll tell you this, he can heal your broken heart. He can make you new. This could be your brand new start. Let's break, let's break it down. Without Jesus, we're doomed. The saving grace of these young girls that, that died in a car accident this week is that all of them, we checked with the mamas. All of them were saved. All of them were born again. And all they did was change addresses. They're home now. <clears throat> but you'll never see them if you're not saved. Jesus died so, and suffered for the sins of mankind. You know what that means? That our sins, our behavior, our angers, anger, our lying, the sexual pleasures we're involved with, and all the things that, all our quirks that we know are sinful, that we hide, all those things might be pleasurable, but they also come with drastic and painful consequences now and for eternity. This is what's at stake. And a lot of people don't want to hear this. Let's not forget, Jesus means nothing if he cannot save you from hell. From the hell you're living and eternal hell. He's the only Savior. He's the only one that died and rose from the dead. He paid the full price for every sin that we've ever committed. And he did that because he loves you and he wants a relationship with you. That's all he wants. So what would Jesus want from me? He just wants your heart. He comes with everything else. He comes with the peace. He comes with the joy. He comes with forgiveness. He, Jesus is, his spirit is not here to condemn you. His spirit is not here to judge you. His spirit is here to heal you, to make you whole, to set you free, to give you eternal life. That you would know before you leave this place. Because tomorrow is not guaranteed. Those young ladies were here last week. And they're gone for eternity. I think it was Sunday night when that accident happened. No one knew. 18 years old. Gone into eternity. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. So I'm going to ask you a serious question. If today were your last day on, on earth, are you on track? Are you ready to go to heaven? And you say, Pastor, I think so. And if you said this, I think I'm going to heaven. And I say, why? And you said this, because I'm a pretty good person. Nowhere in the Bible does it say... If you're a pretty good person, you get into heaven. You cannot get into heaven because you're a good person. You get into heaven when you recognize you're a sinner and you call on Jesus to save you. You get into heaven. Heaven is just, this is what heaven is. A whole bunch of forgiven sinners that received eternal life by faith, by just, by just believing. How do you come to Jesus exactly where you are? You don't fix your life and come to Jesus. You come with your depression, your hopelessness, your broken heart, your struggles. You come the way you are. He loves you. He forgives you. He sets you free. He gives you the gift of eternal life. You've heard the scripture. For God so loved the world. Who's the world? Me and you. He loved the world so much that he sent his only son. So that whoever believes in Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection from the dead, he paid the price. For the wrong we've done. So we can be forgiven. Everyone that believes in him will have, will have right now 
eternal life. Wow. Eternal life is not just living forever. Eternal life is a quality of life. It's fullness of life. You could have it today. When I count to three, you say, Pastor, that's me. I want a new beginning. I want a new start. I want to give my life to just one. Or I need to recommit my life to the Lord. I've been off track. I'm a believer. But I've been off track. I'm ready to get back on track. And I want you to understand this. If you've been off track, the only way you can get back on track is admit you've been off track. And then take some action. Let this be a brand new beginning for real. Two. And when I say three, say, Pastor, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm not even asking you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Because I've learned this. If you're ashamed of the Lord in this building, you'll be ashamed of him out there. Jesus died publicly for you. He wasn't ashamed. It takes it's a real man or woman to give their life to Jesus. Right, get ready. I want to recommit. I want to get back on track. I want to be saved. I'm going to turn up. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this building. I see the hand. I see the hand over there. I see the hand over there. Proud of you. Come on. Takes a real man. Proud of you, baby. Proud of you. Come on. Takes a real man to do that. I'm proud of you. Come on. Anybody else over here? Proud of you over here. Anybody else? Come on. You come. You come the way you are. You come with addiction. He sets you free. All that raise their hands. All that raise their hands. I want you to leave your seat and do me a big, big favor. We're just going to pray. I want you, if you raise your hand, leave your seat and come up here real quick. We're just going to pray. This is a sign that you're done living your whole life. And you're making a real decision. I'm not just walking. I'm not just talking. I'm walking. I'm walking. Come on, let's give God some praise. Ask your neighbor. You want to go up there, I'll go up there with you. Come on, bring your depression, bring your sickness, bring your failures, bring your struggle, bring your losses, bring your anger, bring the unforgiveness, bring the abuse. Let him heal you. Let him set you free. Bring your hopelessness. All right. All right, Anthony, God bless you. Daniel, Daniel, God bless you guys. It takes a real man to live for Jesus. We're going to be family for good forever and ever and ever. I will let you know this. This is going to be the stable thing in your life. I made a pledge. I'm, I know this 100%. I am not leaving San Bernardino. I ain't going to be here till the day I die. When I'm talking about, we, this is going to be a stable place for us. Why? Because God loves you and I love you. We're going to do this together. We got classes for you to take to help you grow. But I'm so proud of this first step. After this is forgiveness. God's going to give you salvation. He's going to give you the gift of eternal life. But you're making the decision today. I'm living for Jesus from here on out. Jesus is my Savior. You're going to become a brand new person. His spirit's going to come and live inside of you. He's going to fill you with his presence. And all you need to do is keep showing up to church. Keep hanging out with us. I would say this, give us a year of your life. And I guarantee you this, you won't even recognize you a year from now. You're like, who am I? Come on, it's going to happen. Okay, what's your name, honey? God bless you, Destiny. Love you. What's your name? What's your name? Denise, it's going to be a, this is a brand new day. Okay. Oh, come on, this is a brand new day. All the depression is going to go. Oh, come on. There, this is a place you're going to be loved. This is going to be a place you're going to be accepted. We're talking about God's unconditional love. He said, come on, and I want you to understand this. He loves you too much to leave you where you're at. Come on, you're going to go on a journey of a new beginning. Come on, some of you guys are going to smile for the first time in your life. I mean, first time in a long time. It's going to turn around. You're going to be saved. Let's pray right now. The Bible said if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, and you believe that he rose again from the dead. And you confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. So say this with me. Say, say this. Say, Jesus, I thank you for speaking to me today. I know my life has been off track. I've not been, I have not been progressing. I've not been succeeding. Something has to change. And today... I come to you, and I believe this. I know I'm a sinner, but I believe that you died for sinners. You paid the price for all the wrong I've done. Forgive me, Lord, 
I receive forgiveness. And I forgive everybody that has hurt me. And today, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I am saved. I receive the free gift of eternal life. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and set me free from all addiction, bad habits, depression, fear, anxiety, and all demons. I thank you, Jesus. I am a new person. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Congratulations, every one of you. Your next step, get baptized.